afternoon. My name is Joanna Wójcik. I am an academic teacher, the head of the university's e-learning center and a researcher in the field of new technologies in education. Tonight, I would like to reflect with you on the challenges of widespread internet use for critical thinking. My talk will be divided into four parts. First, I will focus on the definition of critical thinking. Then, I will discuss the most important features of the web, which have a great influence of the opinions that we formulate. In the third part, I will discuss critical thinking as one of the most important 21st century skills. And finally, I will present the result of some project undertaken by the University of Information Technology and Management in Rzeszów. The projects that help students develop critical thinking skills. Since ancient times, many thinkers have contributed to the development of an approach to teaching and learning called critical thinking. It is widely accepted that the modern tradition of critical thinking stems from the work of American philosopher, psychologist and educator John Dewey. The definition presented on this slide comes from his student Robert Ennis, who creatively developed his findings and wrote one of the most popular academic textbooks on critical thinking, from which successive generations of American students have learned. Careful analysis of the de definitions reveals the key elements of critical thinking. Firstly, critical thinking involves actively analysing the content, as opposed to passively accepting it. The responsibility of a critical thinker is to ask questions and to find relevant information, not to be a passive learner instructed by someone else. Secondly, a critical thinker needs time for a careful analysis of an issue. Of course, in everyday life, we sometimes need to make a decision quickly, but by definition, we should make an effort to take the time to think things through. The tradition of critical thinking emphasizes the importance of, importance of arguing, justifying and evaluating to the best of one's ability, considering the circumstances. Thirdly, the definition mentions decision making. Deciding what to do is also a part of critical thinking. Decisions can be made in a more or less skillful way, in a more or less rational way. There is no doubt that the decisions mentioned in the above definitions are mainly made in everyday life, at home, working, shopping, voting, etc. For this reason, it is cruci crucial in teaching critical thinking that the skills acquired by students do not remain the dry theory, but will be used in practice. So the following should be remembered. The term critical thinking does not have a negative connotation. Thinking critically doesn't mean looking for an error or flaw in every possible statement or behavior. Another common mistake is to equate critical thinking with creative thinking. It is impossible to draw an equivalence between the two. It is easy to imagine someone who thinks very creatively, but is confused about the rules of logical reasoning. Also, a person may be excellent at solving problem they encounter but lack the ability to analyze and justify what they have done. Furthermore, to be effective in some situations, it is necessary to reject critical thinking and blindly follow instructions. Uh, since the late 19th century, the world has undergone a media revolution, from print to radio and television to the digital environment. The way we, com the way we communicate and teach is also adapting to these changes. The internet and digital media are in some ways a continuation of the old mass media, but they are also something unique, an integration of all types of media in a new environment. There is no guarantee that critical thinking tools and skills are not changing. Given the pervasive online immersion, the critical thinker will need to develop new tools and acquire new skills. One of the fundamental features of the Internet is the image. The printed world 
is no longer the primary source of information. In addition, communication is becoming faster and faster, forcing instant reactions. Classical critical thinking, based on logic and careful consideration of arguments, has begun to lose its importance in favor of intuition and persuasion. A large proportion of internet users are unaware of how widespread access to the internet can affect the formulation of opinions and decision making. The three main features of the web that affect the critical thinking process are unreviewed content, algorithmic search, and personalization. We'll now look at each of these features separately. We need to realize that the web was designed from the outset to be a place where you can find all kinds of information, from the valuable to the useless, from information that is important to the general public to information that is of interest to a handful of enthusiasts. Today, thanks to efforts of programmers, a person who wants to publish content on the web faces no obstacles. He or she does not need to have any technological knowledge or incur any cost other than paying for internet access. In the case of print content or even radio and television, the average user had no way of publishing their own content. By definition, these media also took responsibility for the sources of information on which the message was based. On the web, on the other hand, we can publish anything without bothering to cite the source. So what are the challenges for critical thinking? I will say that much information on the web is simply wrong. Authors sometimes knowingly mislead their readers. Sometimes they believe what they publish or they repeat the unproven opinions of other internet users. False information can spread easily and it's not always easy to trace its source. There is, of course, the other side of the coin. There is untested content of good quality and it's a mistake to reject it. The web allows the collection of new types of information that would not have been published or even considered for publication in older media, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be aware of this internet feature. It is no coincidence that the Google logo appears on the screen. Google offers the most widely used search engine on the internet. Every day, millions of users enter queries and Google's algorithms decide what the user is really looking for. In a traditional library, it is still possible to find all the books based on the description, author, year of publication, publisher, ISBN number. On the web, it's not possible to find all the items. Searching algorithms collect information about queries of internet users and their reactions to the content they find. Even programmers cannot co control fully the result, the search engines they write themselves. It is not worth being afraid of algorithms, but it's worth being able to explain the concept, not on the basis of technological details, because algorithms change and some are not fully available. Nevertheless, every informed internet user should understand how to search, what to search for, and how to evaluate what is found. Many studies of online search strategies of general internet users, including students, show that they don't know, they don't know how to formulate precise queries and how to modify them. Rather than searches tend to be chaotic in nature. In addition, when combined with unreviewed content, we can get a result such as when searching for the keyword 
vaccination. Any use of the key term vaccination in a search exposes us to finding a huge number of anti-vaccination sites, for sure more than research-based sites. A third very important feature of the web is its high degree of personalization. In the case of mass media, such as television and radio, the message is the same for everyone, although this is beginning to change. Of course, personalization in the case of teaching and learning is nothing new. Many years ago, online courses were created based on personalized learning paths depending on the knowledge input, the progress made in the course and the learning style assigned to the students. In contrast, personalization in relation to the web means that the web remembers users and uses everything it knows about them. Personalization technologies are still being developed, as the case of algorithmic search. It is therefore important to focus on their implication for critical thinking. Most frequently used techniques related to personalization are contextual and behavioral targeting. Contextual targeting is an advertising technique where ads are displayed based on the content of a particular web page and the type of device and location of the user. Behavioral targeting, on the other hand, allows advertisers and publishers to serve relevant and ads and the marketing messages to users based on their web browsing behavior. Another phenomenon on the web, which I believe is worth mentioning, is the so-called filter bubble. It is a tendency of people to obtain information from the web in such a way that they only see information that confirms their prior expectations. However, recent studies show that filter bubble that completely cut users off from opinions that contradict their views are marginal phenomenon. A much greater constraint on openness to new information is the environment in which an individual lives. The importance of personalization for critical thinking lies in the recognition that persuasive message can be intentionally prepared to take advantage of increasingly detailed knowledge about the recipient. There are many examples of such activities, including those related to political elections. Conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, propaganda and alternative medicine are the most commonly observed daily consequences of lack of critical thinking. Poorly educated audiences are encouraged to sustain their distorted view of reality as long as they form important consumer groups, attractive to conspiracy publishers, authoritarian politician regimes, or the alternative medicine industry. The inability to evaluate sources of information can seriously undermine the public's ability to protect itself from fraud. This is not new. A conspiratorial view of history, politics of science, has always appealed to some members of the public. But thanks to internet, such theories have gained a huge reach. Belief in conspiracy theories is closely related to pseudoscience. We need to remember that not every layperson is capable of understanding scientific discourse, which consists of the careful collation of documented facts. Pseudoscience offers the illusion of understanding without effort. Three conclusions of the previous considerations are crucial in teaching critical thinking. That is, search results depend on the user's skills and the performance of the algorithms. The second, it is impossible to independently verify all sources. The ability to manage the cognitive environment is essential. Let's look at these points in detail one by one. 
university teachers are often confronted with unverified sources in students' work. Information is taken often from unverified websites as a result of a quick search on the internet. One solution to this problem is to provide training in formulating correct and detailed queries. This is particularly important in the context of the widespread availability of large language models, such as chat GPD, where the ability to write correct prompts is crucial. Another suggested solution widely used in universities is to encourage students to use databases of scientific articles or search tools dedicated to scientific papers. This doesn't mean that non-academic sources are unacceptable. However, basic principles of verification should be taught. Surprisingly, it usually turns out that even the knowledge of the sources we now see on the screen is very limited. Above all, internet users, especially students, should be aware of the research skills and not overestimated them. Of course, it is worth improving search skills, but one should also be aware that searching for information is only the beginning. The gathered information still needs to be organized, interpreted and concluded. Assessing the credibility of information generated by contributions from individual internet users is a major challenge. If a topic is covered by researchers, there are likely to be reliable sources on it. This could be academic articles, expert blogs or government sources. On the other hand, there is a whole range of topics that are of interest to ordinary people, but not to experts. We should not dismiss information that is not relevant to experts out of hand, but think about how to assess its quality. Some tips on how to check information are presented on the screen. The question arises, does the internet user need to be completely alone in checking information? The answer is no. We need to trust reliable institutions that are dedicated to fact-checking by employing experts. It turns out that, paradoxically, access to primary sources is also a problem. An internet user can download raw data and research reports, but is anyone capable of interpreting them correctly without domain knowledge and contacting experts? Assumptions that are obvious to experts are not necessarily obvious to the average read reader, which can lead to misinterpretation. Luckily, specialized algorithms can also help to detect fake content. Many scientific studies show that it is possible to identify inauthentic content by analyzing large data sets. Another well-documented error in assessing the credibility of information is the so-called Dunning-Kruger effect, which is a tendency of people with poor skills in a particular area to greatly overestimate their abilities. Some people are convinced that they are smarter and more qualified than they actually are. As the chart shows, the most incompetent people overestimated their skills most dramatically. Conversely, the more competent people underestimate their skills because of their experience and awareness of their shortcomings. This effect shows that incompetent people often suffer the consequences of their ignorance without being aware of it. A critical thinker should be able to question and even doubt his own ability to understand what experts say. When using the internet, one should be aware of new conditions that affect critical thinking. As the web becomes more integrated into everyday life, its impact becomes less noticeable. 
Therefore, the ability to manage the cognitive environment is very important. Daily exposure to content that is, that is unreviewed, tailored by algorithms and biased, has serious consequences for critical thinking. Managing the cognitive uh, environment means, first and foremost, making conscious choices about how we allocate attention. For example, we can limit the amount of time we spend on social media or choose a few reliable sources to use instead of constantly scanning dozens of sites. It is also a good idea to use tools that offer greater anonymity when using the web. If you want to think critically, sometimes we have to sacrifice the convenience of the tools available, which bring us to the next point, perhaps the most important one. Self-criticism is the foundation of critical thinking. To oversimplify, we can say that the difference between a critical person and an uncritical person is their willingness to question their own position. Critical thinkers are willing to change their minds according to the facts, and critical people refuse to change their minds despite the facts. As academics, when teaching critical thinking, we should first and foremost look for errors in logic and bias in ourselves, not just in our students. It, if it's painful for us as academics to apply the principle of self-criticism, it will also be painful for students. Now let's look at the problem of lack of critical thinking skills from the side of labor market. Maybe the next sentence will sound trivial, but in view of increasing amount of information that can be acquired by a single click, the ability to think critically is fundamental to both personal and professional development. Organizations need employees equipped with these skills regardless of their position. The ability to think critically enables employees to dynamically engage in productive and positive activities and to combine theoretical knowledge with company practice. The European Commission, in published reports, stresses that critical thinking skills allow better preparation for inevitable progress. The World Economic Forum ranks critical thinking and problem solving as the most important skills as work becomes more difficult and complex in the future. As a result, employees with critical thinking and decision-making skills who can initiate new solutions for their organizations will be in demand in the new world of work. As we can see from the accompanying graph, half of the skills are in the problem-solving and critical thinking categories. There are many abilities related to the skill of critical thinking, such as judging the credibility of sources, identifying conclusions, motivations and assumptions, judging the quality of argument, including the acceptability of its reasons, assumptions and evidence, and many others. The basic ones are listed on the screen. Note that these skills are needed regardless of position, so discussion applies not only to highly skilled professionals, but to all employees. Let's take a look at the statistics. According to a study by the European Agency Eurostat in 2021, nearly 47% of all people aged 16 to 74 in the UA had seen false or questionable information on new sites or social media in the three months prior to the survey. However, only about a quarter of internet users checked the accuracy of the information or content. The highest percentage of users who checked information they found was in the Netherlands, 45%. The highest percentage of internet users who uncritically accept what they find online is in Lithuania, where only 11% 
have checked it. This is followed by Romania and sadly Poland. When 39% of internet users have come across suspicious information, but only 16% have bothered to check its credibility. These figures do not inspire optimism. They are a challenge, especially for universities. It has long been assumed in higher education that students, as a generation of digital natives, are adept at using computer and searching for information, and therefore competent in the use of digital media. However, studies show that students perform poorly when it comes to correctly assessing the reliability of content, despite their familiarity with various digital media, for example, social networking sites, video sites, etc. Students use them mainly for personal entertainment or communication and are unable to apply their digital skills to the learning process. In 2009, UNESCO announced that the development of critical and ethical thinking in graduates is becoming a goal of higher education worldwide. As a result, critical thinking skills are increasingly included in higher education learning outcomes and curriculum documents and appear in degree programs and course descriptions. There is general agreement that strengthening and developing critical thinking is needed at all levels of education in all courses and fields of study, but there is not always agreement on how this should be done and which methods are most effective. The discussion is facing the question on how to directly and indirectly incorporate critical thinking into study programs. How can universities teach their students critical thinking? The standard approach used in Anglo-Saxon countries and increasingly in Poland are courses called critical thinking, logic with rhetoric, art of argumentation and the like. Most courses follow the syllabus presented. On the screen we see a standard illustration from the critical thinking textbook. As we can see, the emphasis is on the evaluation of argument, the universality of the rules of argumentation and in, in its important in many areas of human life makes the art of argumentation a central part of critical thinking skills. Recognizing and understanding the arguments we encounter in everyday discussion is an important and useful skill. Unfortunately, it is not a skill that is common or despite appearances easy to acquire. The big problem is that the statements we make every day are often quite chaotic and difficult to fit into the patterns we encounter in the critical thinking textbook. I strongly believe that a critical thinker should have the knowledge and high level skills developed in a basic critical thinking course. However, the real challenge is to apply critical thinking outside of academia. The transfer of skills from the classroom to everyday life is the greatest challenge facing the universities. The University of Information Technology and Management in Rzeszów, where I work, has many years of experience in the field of students' career planning and the acquisition of skills needed in the labor market. Particular emphasis is placed on critical thinking and problem-solving skills. The BIST family of project is a good example of this. The BIST approach was developed in collaboration with researchers from the partners' universities, which names you see on the screen. The following projects are a logical continuation of the previous ones and each brings something new to the topic of students' career planning and development. The approach is designed to help students plan or change their educational pathways at the university, taking into account their passions, interests and personal resources in relation to current labour market 
requirements. It should be noted that results of the above project have been widely implemented in academic practice. You can get acquainted with the details of the presented approach by reading the free scientific monograph in Polish and English available for download from the University of Warsaw Publishing House website. What are the main assumptions of the BIST approach? I think that the most important one is that passion and interest should be the main drivers of professional development as they are far more important to well-being and fulfillment than formal education. Professional development today should be based on prototyping, testing and revising the direction rather than blindly following a prepared path. Career development should focus on professional identity rather than specific jobs. New jobs appear and others disappear. Understanding and internalizing the philosophy of lifelong learning and the readiness to respond quickly to change make it possible to find a match between current labor market requirements and personal resources. So how are these assumptions related to the topic of today's meeting? The analysis of scientific articles, the results developed by projects, and the observation of the students during the testing workshop showed the existence of a number of key competencies related to the development of the digital economy. Competencies which are relevant regardless of the field of study and desired by employees. Key skills included critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, creativity and entrepreneurship. This raised the question of how we, as academics, should help to shape these competencies. The main idea that guided us was that development of 21st century skills should take place as a part of teaching of each course. As I said before, in the case of critical thinking, it is obviously a good idea to have a course dedicated fully to it in the curriculum. Such a subject provides a starting point for understanding the basic concepts. However, it may be perceived by students as unnecessary and irrelevant to the real world. So let's take a look at the list of learning strategies and methods on the screen. This list is based on, uh, on analysis of research on developing students' critical thinking skills. It can serve as a guide for teachers trying to develop such skills. What exactly should the teacher do? How should they integrate the strategies outlined in their teaching? I encourage teachers to use the guidelines we have prepared. They are available free of charge and contain a full description of each strategy. To be clear, this doesn't mean that every teacher should use all the strategies and tools in every lesson. It will depend on the course, the form of classes, the number of teaching hours, etc. However, the point is that development of 21st century skills should not be implemented only in the form of isolated courses. Applying visible on the slide strategies in any course helps to shape ability to think critically in the context of the task to be performed in the workplace in the future. How the content of the subject can be closely linked to the requirement of labor market was the main theme of the project discussed earlier, but this is a topic for another presentation. When analyzing the list of available strategies, the question still remains how to encourage the teachers to use these strategies. Typically, there is a lot of material co to cover in class and very limited time. Teachers may be concerned that incorporating these strategies into classroom will take time and require a lot of work on their part. In addition, not all teachers feel comfortable with that theme of critical thinking. This is where BEAST and the Pills for 21st Century Skills 
developed by the team behind the approach come in. They can be used by a teacher regardless of the subject he or she teaches. The skills encourage students to reflect on the content being discussed, but above all, they allow both teachers and students to develop many habits related to the activation of critical thinking mechanism. The, pill, mm, the pills correspond to the strategies and methods mentioned above. The teacher, after studying the pills, will be able to choose pill that can be applied to his course. Same times, it will be one pill, same times a whole set. The use of pills with reinforce good critical thinking habits and hopefully eliminate bad ones. We look at two of these pills in detail. The one shown on the screen is about an activity called pre-writing, which prepares us to write a paper, report or essay. In general, writing for educational purposes helps to develop reasoning and critical thinking skills. Writing requires the ability to discriminate between relevant and irrelevant information, to test one's own hypotheses and to deal with different inputs such as images, graphics or text. Writing is therefore seen as an essential tool for enabling students to think critically. Writing and critical thinking are deeply intertwined because writing is based on thinking. Writing is both a process of critical thinking and a product that communicates the result of critical thinking. Through the process of writing, students have the opportunity to deepen their thinking, formulate their ideas, clarify their point of view, and develop their intellectual skills. If we analyze the content of this pill, we see that as a teacher, we are given a specific algorithms to use such a pill during a lesson, along with estimation of time. This exercise is based on the internet and allows us, as a teacher, first three, to discuss the characteristic of information found on the internet, but above all, to show, with a specific example, all the assumptions we talked about earlier, about searching on the internet. The second pill I would like to show you, and which most teachers can use, is the ideal technique which accompanies the teaching strategy of problem-based learning and project-based learning. Problem solving is the ability to approach a problem by following a multi-step process. So step one, I identify the problem. What are we dealing with? In step two, D, define the context. What are the main elements of the problem? Step three, E, enumerate the choices. What option do we have? Step four, A, analyze the options. What is the best alternative available? Step five, L, list the reason explicitly. Why is this the best available alternative? And finally, step six, S, self-correction. Looking at the problem again, what have we missed? This method of problem solving uses learner participation and guides students to the critical thinking process. It is important to remember that effective problem solving does not mean going off and finding an answer immediately. The use of structured process should help students to think critically about the problem and find the best solution. This technique teaches students to be aware of online sources and the media and to carefully evaluate published scientific claims or arguments. We hope that the collection of pills along with the tutorial will inspire academics to improve their classes and foster critical thinking skills among students, especially since research show an increase in critical thinking skills has a visible effect on academic performance. Of course, for us, teachers, a serious approach to critical thinking will mean more work. We will have to modify the lessons we teach 
and expand our knowledge in this area. Widespread introduction of critical thinking as a part of class can also lead to lessons that no longer run so smoothly. Students may ask out-of-the-box questions, inquire into our own sources of information and negate the knowledge we impart. Isn't that the point? We plan to educate university students who are able to think critically, who are competent in evaluating information found on the internet, who are able to consciously use the media ecosystem. To sum up our lecture, in the era of widespread intuitive approaches to virtual reality, critical thinking is even more important and increasingly desired. And higher education institutions are a natural environment in which critical thinking can be nurtured. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I will try to answer your questions and listen to your comments. I would greatly appreciate if you could share your own experiences in fostering critical thinking in the age of the Internet. What are the risks of using artificial intelligence and developing critical thinking in students? I think over-reliance on technology can be a barrier to the development of critical thinking skills. Pupils and uh, students may become too dependent on AI tools and lose the ability to complete tasks without technological support. Research also shows that indiscriminate use of AI tools by students can limit how they think, although the answers provided by AI are usually at good level, they are not off the charts. Immediate corrections of students' mistakes is also unwelcome. Making mistakes is a part of learning process. Mistakes help students understand what they are doing wrong. Another major risk of artificial intelligence is the loss of human interactions. A student who uses an AI personal assistant while learning might stop developing interpersonal communication skills and focus just on interacting with the machine. At what age should we start teaching children to think critically? Is there a limit? That is a really interesting question. Research in recent years has shown that young children are much more mature thinkers than we once believed. This means that critical thinking can be taught as early as preschool. For example, a young child can be taught to process information, for example, to recognize falsehoods in advertising, to identify the cause of problems, to understand emotions, but be guided by a reason, and so on. We must remember that, as I said earlier, critical thinking is cross-curricular. It should be taught by every teacher in all classes. But it is also important to remember that factual knowledge is still important. It's very difficult to evaluate a statement if you don't have a basic knowledge. This is mainly because without basic knowledge, you cannot understand the statement. Every teacher who does his or her, her job well contributes to the development of critical thinking skills in students. What are the best practices for the identification and control of false information on the Internet? So there are two perspectives to consider, individual and institutional. Internet users can protect themselves from fake news and misinformation by following a variety of individuals and perspectives. It is a good idea to rely on a small number of verified sources. This does not give us an absolute guarantee of avoiding fake news, but it increases the chance of reading balanced and diverse viewpoints. In the online world, readers should also be skeptical about new sources. We should be aware that many sites are using fake news to increase sales or social media reach. From an institutional perspective, tech companies in particular should invest in technology to find fake news and 
identify it for users through algorithms and crowdsourcing. It's also important to weaken the financial incentives for bad content, especially fake news and disinformation, as the creation of fake news is often financially motivated. Educational institutions also have a responsibility. Helping people become better consumers of online information is crucial as the world moves towards digital immersions. It is therefore important to support teachers and students in improving their digital literacy and critical thinking skills. I hope that I, I answered all your questions. Thank you for your attention and I hope that we'll meet in the future and we will be able to talk each other personally about critical thinking skills and uh, challenges of the internet. Thank you.